Call the uh, April 1st, 2019 meeting to order for our select board. Uh, before we begin, I wanted the board members to know I got a call from Skip Flanders tonight um, informing me of the uh, April 17th employee breakfast down at St. Leo's Hall. At uh, starts at 6 for anybody that's going to be there to... Uh, assist in the cooking process and um, everybody else can show up at seven and it's a uh, fifteen dollar fee for helping to pay for all the goodies um, again that's a lot that's uh, april april 17th down here at st leo's so with that i'll uh move forward here with uh, a motion to approve the agenda is there any changes I don't have any changes. Mm -hmm. I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Mm -hmm. Second. Second that. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those that approve say aye. 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 Uh, consent agenda items. Minutes from March 18th meeting. Uh, an outside consumption permit for the Prohibition Pig. Liquor licenses for the Bluestone. Jimmy's Pizza. The Reservoir. Old Stagecoach Inn, South Street Cafe, Woodstock Farmer's Market, Inc., which was formerly Pete's Greens, and the Vitality Mart. So I make a motion to approve that agenda, please. I make a motion to approve those items. Okay. I second that motion. All right. Anybody wish to further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Public. Anybody here from the public wishes to speak at this time? Well, it's going to be a short night. Um, all right, we'll move on to the 708 item. <coughs> Interviews for the Waterbury Ambulance Service Trustees. Where do we begin? Is somebody here? So, um, yep, there are two people here for that, actually. Uh, just to refresh your memories and to bring Mike up to speed, uh, the Waterbury Ambulance Service, as you know, for the first time ever this year, asked for an appropriation from the towns it serves. Uh, in the past, we have uh, provided uh, both low-cost space to the ambulance service and dispatching, uh, but this year they asked for a cash uh, appropriation, and our cash appropriation took into consideration those other two items that we already pay for. So um, our appropriation was $39,770 this year. And um, one of the things that the ambulance, uh, Wasi Ambulance Incorporated did, Water Ambulance Service Incorporated did, was uh, they amended their bylaws uh, when they decided to ask the towns for a contribution. And the amendment allows each town to appoint one member to its board of trustees. So the Waterbury Ambulance trustees already exist. Uh, the WASI membership will be electing some of the board members, and then three of the board members will be appointed by the three towns that, that they got an appropriation from, uh, Waterbury, Duxbury, and uh, Moortown. And the bylaws, I met with, um, with Mark Podgewhite last week just to confirm things. Um, this is just a fact, it's not an issue, but I did ask if all three of the <coughs> communities got the same number of trustees, regardless of population. You know, Waterbury has over 5,000 people. Moortown is served by two ambulance services, and only a small portion of Moortown is uh, included in the Wasi district. And you know, I think there's less than 2,000 people in that section of Moortown. And right now, the um, the bylaw is that each town appoints one. So um, that may be something that could be discussed in the future, but it would require them to change their bylaws if it was going to be different. So anyway, a um, couple of meetings ago, the board asked Carla to advertise uh, for anybody who might be interested. 
the next WASI meeting is on the 18th of April, and um, they would like to have the new appointees at that meeting. So Mr. Frank and Ms. Dillon have expressed interest and are here to be interviewed by the board. You're going to get to choose to pick one. And I don't know if you want to interview them both while they're both sitting here. If you want to send one of them out into the other room, that's your choice. But we did our job by getting two people here. So. <laughs> that's better than a lot. <laughs> uh, unless anybody's got any objections, you're welcome to sit here if you would like while the other one's talking. Uh, Okay. Sure. Come on up, Mike. Yeah, come on up, Mike. Sure. Come on up over here and have a seat and tell us why you're so excited about it. Well, um, my Frank, um, I'm involved in the I've been in Warbury for a well, number of years. I moved in 92, I think, here originally, kid, and I moved away and came back. Um, I'm a member of the Warby Fire Department. Um, I was a member of WASI um, when I first moved here, but um, due to a um, number of family and <laughs> all the things that come up, um, I couldn't maintain my EMT and do all the time. So um, I'm fam overall, so overall familiar with WASI, at least from years ago, of how it works. Um, and um, so I'm overall just interested to be um, part of it. Um, my background, too, um, I do have a master's of science, um, which is like half an MBA type thing, too. So I understand the financial parts and reading financial statements and the cash flow that goes with it um, and things that go into managing um, the endowment and funds and requesting that. So both familiar with what the ambulance service does and the financial parts that go behind it. Shortly. Um. Bill just stepped out. I'm curious to know uh, how many times you guys would meet a month and or a year. Do you know anything about that? No, I'm actually not familiar with okay. that specifically over that. Yeah. Um, um, when Dylan you, would be very familiar with that. Yeah, I was <laughs> thinking probably so. It's What's that? Quarterly. Yeah. Quarterly. I, I knew the involvement was not like a weekly uh, <laughs> meeting affair because they have a director and so we managed it. I have a question. Uh, being involved with the fire department, uh, how much first aid training do you have that, because I'm sure you, you mm -hmm. have to know a lot of that, you know, their, their operations. Yeah, I was an EMTB oh, on WASI, okay. um, so um, I was a nationally certified EMTB, no, national registry, whatever it's called. Well, I heard that. <laughs> sure, thanks. So, and we maintain CPR and stuff like that in the fire department. Great. Um, Hmm. Well, it's a tough one uh, as far as asking questions about it. Yeah. Um, uh, when, how long have you been back? I moved back, so I went off to college. I went to college in 1999 and moved back to um, Waterbury in 2006. Mm -hmm. So I've been in Waterbury for a while. I um, mostly grew up in the village, and now I live in Waterbury Center. So. <laughs> In, uh, in this community and really enjoy being part of here. And even when we, we've been thinking about moving sometimes, my wife and I, but it was like, we Waterbury. all do that. It's like one Waterbury to Waterbury to maybe this part of Duxbury, Moortown, really the, <laughs> it, it was kind of the WASI uh, <laughs> coverage area, which is basically uh, <laughs> limits of moving but where we're at right now. Is there a reason why you want to serve on a WASI as a trustee versus other uh, town boards? Um, I'm familiar with Water Ambulance overall. Um, I do want to get more involved with the town and the community because um, I know there's many different places to assist um, with it. And so it's something that I'm familiar with. Um, I'm passionate about the services back when I was there and, and now, um, especially as a first responder. Um, mm -hmm. It's important that we have it. And it's um, been, we've been lucky and thank to um, probably doesn't help my position, but thanks to the trustees before and all that through um, WASI, it's this is the first year asking for true appropriations from the town, which is pretty, I know it's money being spent, um, but it's a lot better position than um, many towns are. We're really lucky here in Waterbury. 
So it sounds like they're having a more difficult time as time goes on, uh, you know, operating the, the ambulance service itself uh, financially. Um, any ideas off the top of your head there moving forward, what, what you think uh, you can contribute to as far as uh, uh, how to make things better or? Uh, it's, it's a tough situation as discussed at town meeting too. A lot of the drivers for this is um, trying to get people to volunteer for the service. It's a lot of work, um, which I understand because um, I had a fire department and that. Um, so be between maintaining the certifications, which are getting stricter and stricter, um, and having people cover the shifts, it's tough to get the volunteers. So they have more paid personnel now. Uh, when I left, um, there was, I think as I started, they had one, one or two paid personnel, uh, and it was increased a little bit, and we started stipends right as they left too, because it was a lot cheaper to run when um, you don't have the personnel costs. Um, but a lot of other drivers' equipment, um, but some of those costs that are going into it are very important. I've seen some of the new equipment that's there um, with the auto loader um, gurney that they have now on the trucks. It makes it a lot better because when you're lifting people up, and we've got there, we've got the power lifters, which helps a lot. If you imagine if someone that's well, even a 160 pound person, but imagine a 300 pound person, you try and get them, <laughs> lift them up and try and load them in an ambulance. Um, a lot of times it's taking multiple people, the ambulance is parked on a slope, it, try and get them in safely um, without hurting one's back. Um, is important. So some of these expenditures are are necessary um, and are good in the long run with the community. But so I don't have anything specific on that because um, a lot of drivers are external, um, but always looking for ways to reduce those costs. So we're not coming back to the taxpayers asking for more and more and more. Yeah, yeah. That's a chronic problem everywhere you look these days. And a lot of the reimbursement rates, it's not sort of out of the control of watching. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any uh, fundraising background? Um, try to go through um, nothing very specific other than being involved in different um, small fundraisers, but it's not as much from an uh, organizational standpoint. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Another Wasi for fundraiser, they do the, the mailing every year, which brings in a decent amount uh, of the subscription based. Um, and I don't mean this to be leading or um, suggest that whomever gets appointed does <coughs> anything except a WASI trustee who's looking out for WASI. Mm -hmm. I do think that some of the impetus anyway about putting the, uh, allowing the towns to appoint a trustee is to not necessarily have a a watchdog from mm -hmm. the town, but have somebody that's representing the town's mm -hmm. interest, not simply Wasi all the way. And I'm not saying that they're not melded or meshed, but I think you understand what, yep. I'm, what I'm suggesting, that um, I think part of the concern about any time an organization like Wasi makes their first, you know, the proverbial nose <laughs> under the Campbell's nose under the tent <laughs> that next the head's going to be inside the tent and then pretty soon the whole camel's in. And, um, I would just like you to, if you get appointed, to just remember that um, the, the point is to help have a eyes and ears for the taxpayers of the community as well as be a trustee for Wadsworth. So, I mean, for Watson. Yeah, it's, it's very important. And, and Maintaining, lowering, trying to maintain, <laughs> restrict the res the raising of taxes over time, um, and trying to just increasing, saying, oh, well, that's three percent more this year because of inflation. Um, have to look at more than just that. And that is very important. Yeah. Representative for the town first, foremost. Is that what you're saying, Bill? Well, not necessarily first and foremost, well, but that that mm -hmm. the idea is we're putting somebody on there appointed by the town to represent the town's interest on the board. So, yeah. Very good. Good. All right, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, I need to leave. So I will step out now, because I actually have to go with my daughter, because um, some things fell through, and my wife can't pick her up. So. OK. But anyway. Thanks for coming. Cool. Thank you very much. OK, Ms. Dillon.
Yeah, you really want more responsibility? <laughs> I already do. So. <laughs> um, so what made you decide to get interested in this? So actually, um, I already am a trustee for Waterbury Ambulance and have been for about 20 years. Oh. Um, but right now, currently, there's five trustees from Waterbury. Um, that's reducing down to just two, one that you guys appoint and then one that the ambulance elects. Um, Jim Hermanowski is the current chair of the trustees, and my guess is that he'd be interested in that again. Um, so I decided I would, not knowing who would put their name in for this, I decided I would put my name in. I think that although some good, some new blood is good, I also think continuity is, is good too. You still need some people that understand the ins and outs of it. Um, I think I've been fiscally um, responsible for the ambulance as far as making sure that things aren't bought when they don't need to be bought. Um, that's basically the, we, it's an oversight of the, the finances of the ambulance. It's not really much to do with the actual day-to-day -day operations of the squad unless there's an issue. Um, so knowing so much about what's going on, I mean, what are some of the biggest issues you see coming up that, are, that you're going to be faced with? Um, the biggest issue, I think, right now is um, their building. They've got to do something. Um, we need to figure something out to um, get them into bigger housing because the volunteer well, so to speak, has gone dry and it's really hard to find volunteers. Um, they're having to have per diem people there. Their, their full-time staff work during the day, but per diems, you know, a lot of times we'll work at night and we can't have people spending the night at a place that's not set up for, for overnight accommodations. Um, there's having to buy ambulances to fit, kind of like the fire department had to do. Trucks to fit your building, they're doing the same thing with the ambulances now, and it just gets harder and harder to do that. Um, so definitely that is one of the, the things, the biggest things I think coming in the future, in the near future. Is there any preliminary design work being done or any um, consideration of that? To... They've looked at, um, talked to some people, uh, talked to some people that did like Stowe's design that, which is obviously much bigger than anything we would need, um, and some other people around um, talked to neighboring properties, done <coughs> some, um, some research on that um, and what might be available. Um, adjoining the ambulance building you know, in property that they might be able to just add on to and reconfigure what they have. Um, I know those are things that have been in the work. Mark Podgwait's done a really good job. He's very forward thinking, trying to um, figure out you know, what's the best for the service. The, the challenge with the building is kind of twofold. It's, it, obviously, they want the building to meet their needs, but then you've got to have a site that, that can accommodate the building. And one of the challenges right now, if you know the ambulance building is built at the town's highway garage, and you know there's not a lot of room at that site where you've got sand piles, salt piles, uh, the, the greater shed, uh, parking for employees, and if you try to you know, uh, get the building that they're looking for, finding a place to put it is, has been difficult. I won't say it's impossible, but it, it, we're going to be having a meeting again fairly, fairly soon. Bill Woodruff and, and myself, along with Steve Lotzbeach, are going to meet with Mark to look at their uh, latest iteration. So it, it's a challenge site-wise, even in addition to the building. You've got to Right. Make sure the site can slot. accommodate it, yeah. you know, and, and you've got the septic issues and things like that. Um, do you mind if I ask no. a question? Um, Sally, you mentioned the, the per diems, and they've got people who are working during the day, and then, you know, per diem people, and it's hard to have people there uh, without it being able to be, you know, to accommodate people at night. But if you're paying somebody to be there at night, why do they need to sleep? Um, why can't they just, they work? They're working the, you know, their 12-hour shift right. like you would if you were working the 12-hour shift at a hospital from 11 to 11 or whatever. You could, we could try that, but I think you'd be very hard-pressed to find people that are willing to 
to maybe go there and be up all night. A lot of times per diems actually have regular jobs during the day, nice. um, and then they'll take on you know extra duties or whatever. But um, you know, not maybe there's somebody out there that would be willing no, to I'm do that. But yeah, no, I know I understand that. Yeah, no, nope, no, nope, I completely understand that. But I think a lot of the per diems do work other areas. Um, well, have a, have a place to put your head down if things are slow, you know, I mean, if you're not up and... and right, because it'd be 6, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. is the shift. So they're on call, basically. Correct. They would be on call overnight, yeah. Um, you know, how, how, how far has this gotten to the, to the critical point of we've got to do something soon? Uh, we, I, we I, think we're, I think we're I think we're at that there, critical point. Or, yeah, we are. That, I mean, that type of information is is something that's uh, valuable not only you know to the trustees but also this board. Right. Yep. Uh, I understand that. We, you know, I suspect will be a pretty big part of the municipality will be a pretty big part of how that all comes together. Um, so it's another thing that you know. We're going to have to put up here in our heads, knowing that that's going to be another issue that, at some point here in the near future, we'll be dealing with, uh, along with some of the other things. So, I know they looked at um, upgrading the building, building a bunk room there, so that someone could legally sleep there overnight. And um, but we need to, if we do that, we've got to upgrade the shower there and the bathroom facilities, make it handicap accessible. Um, and there's. They got a quote from a couple people. I think the cheapest was like over $100,000 to do the upgrade there, which is a lot of money to build a bedroom, basically. Yeah. I mean, the, the property itself, um, is it like borderline adequate? The, the, the is, area. Is it the size of the building, the configuration? Not the building the itself. I'm saying if, in order for you to expand. We've looked at a couple of their proposals and, you know, can it fit there adequately? No, that's, it can't. That's so what I'm, yeah, so that's I guess what, yeah. what I'm asking is, I mean, so the site my perspective, the site I should be expand. thinking about possible alternative pieces of property that we could. Right. And they've, they've done a lot of looking. Do. I know Mark, I think, has talked with Bill about that. And they've looked around town and stuff. It's just to find a spot that would be good, kind of centrally located for an ambulance is prime property that you're either going to pay prime price for or somebody's not going to want to just donate it and give it up to for that. Sally, um, what's your medical background as well as um, what's your experience in fundraising? Um, I don't have any medical background other than I've been on the Waterbury Fire Department for almost 36 years. I'm a battalion chief on the department. We've interacted with the ambulance over the years. Um, Years ago, I helped with the red phones for the ambulance service back before they had dispatching. Um, I mean, I have a basic first aid background, but I have a good understanding of the ambulance, the way that it works, the needs, um, the day-to-day -day operations. Um, I've been a trustee there for 20 years, so. Mm -hmm. and, and fundraising? <laughs> fundraising. Um, through the fire department, I've been involved in a couple of good-sized fundraisers. I um, oversaw the Rosina Wallace fundraiser. I oversaw the Mandy Drake fundraiser, where we raised well, almost $20,000. So, Did you lead or participate? I led. Okay. Anybody else here? Like Sally Wood? Um, Um, before the new bylaws take effect, there's, in, in essence, two governing boards at Wasi now. There's a president who's not correct. part of the trustees. That right? is correct. It's and a, then there's a vice president and... Yep, there's a president, a vice president, a trustee, or a treasurer, and a secretary. And they're elected by the members they're of They're elected Washi? by the members. And then there is the executive director, which is Mark Podgeway, who runs the day-to-day -day operations um, of the service. And then there's the board of trustees, which are basically the financial oversight for the service. So the people who elect the president, the vice president, the secretary, and the treasurer, those are the volunteers, if you will, Correct. of that. Yes. So it used to be the red phone people and the Right, and the, the, the EMT, your drivers, the drivers your EMTs, and your, everybody yep, else. Correct. Yep. I assume the uh, 
paid staff doesn't elect those people? Uh, the paid staff actually um, can vote in the. They can. Vote. Yeah, they can vote. In and them. is that structure being left in place with this new? Bylaws? Yeah, it, it is. Um, and I actually questioned the the bylaws are approved by the the members um, that they were going to get rid of all well not all five but to make it equal between all three towns when I mean the bulk of the services covers Waterbury. I mean we right. cover all of Duxbury. The population there is much less. Moortown is much much less. It's Cobb Hill and Route Two from Waterbury to right. the dump. I mean. It's really, it's a very small population. So I think that's something they may decide to revisit and have another representative from Waterbury. I'm not sure on that, but. Okay. So the, the, the president and, and that board, do they, do they adopt, but what do they do? Well, it's, it's changed a lot. The president used to do pretty much what Mark Podgeweight does, and then when we got the executive director, um, things changed, and now the president, pretty much their sole responsibility is to run the business meetings. That's, that's their job. They don't really have any um, like personnel issues Mark deals with. Um, if there's issues, um, somebody has issues with Mark, it goes to the board of trustees. Um, Do the trustees to, adopt the budget or the the, the trust, president and that board? No, the trust. Well, the trustees and the um, tre uh, treasurer, secretary, president, and vice president all vote on the budget. Okay. And that will stay that way. Correct. Yes. Going forward. Yeah. So the the president and those officers under the new bylaws, frankly, are getting more powerful than they were before because there were six, how many trustees were there? There was, uh, let's see, there was five before. So three, I'm sorry, three from Waterbury, one from Duxbury, no, four from Waterbury, one from Duxbury slash Moortown. Because okay. it used to be two from the town, two from the village, and then one from either Duxbury or Moortown coverage area. And then when the village went away, okay. it's just was four from Waterbury and one from the other. It'll be the same. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> moving this process forward, how do we take and choose somebody? We do it here tonight? Um, do we? You can, you can do it tonight. Uh, you can do it on the 15th if you want. Um, the meeting is on the 18th, so, right, it's the 18th. So you could wait until the 15th to make the appointment, or you can do it tonight. Yeah. You can ask them to leave and do it, you know, deliberate about it and do it a little later tonight. It's up to you, but right. you got to do it by the next meeting. <laughs> well, I'll just let you know that, you know, I appreciate both of you coming forward for this position. Uh, unfortunately, there's only one one shoe <laughs> and two feet. So um, we'll uh, we'll talk about it and uh, probably make a decision by next meeting and let you know. Um, That's fine. Uh, again, it's uh, however we choose. It's uh, I'm sure we all wish we could have both of you. So, uh, but they're. Like you said, Mike, there's other other places in the town that uh, we certainly could use volunteers for for as important issues. So appreciate you both coming in. No problem. Thank you. Chris, can you pass along with the other person to oh, your time? Yeah, geez. Not be right now, but. Okay, uh, a discussion on uh, Leaf Peepers Run. Can we can we talk about just that whole discussion surrounding the building and what we might need to just consider as next steps there just to make sure it doesn't fall off too far because we last meeting we talked about what we wanted to focus on this year and it sounds like that's got to be put on the list and well yes and no I, I think it's something that's got to be put on the list um, the ambulance folks have kept us apprised of what they're doing um, 
we own the current building right. and lease it to Wasi. They, they do pay a lease payment. Well, they paid two hundred and fifty dollars two years ago for ten years. So it's you know, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to say they're paying, you can say that. Um, so you know, it, it's going to depend on what they need from us or want from us going forward. Um, I know their preference would be to use the, the site that they're on. Uh, they've, they've had a couple of different iterations, and you know we involved Bill Woodruff and Celia in, in those meetings because you know it's got to be able to accommodate the highway department's needs as well, and it's it's tight. There's it, it's just tight. If they decide to go off site, then it's not. I don't, unless they come to the town and ask the town to buy the, the property, and I think given that there's two other towns involved, that it shouldn't just be us. So we'll keep you apprised, but I, I, I'm not sure at this point how much it's going to affect us or what they're asking of us right now. I think, I think my bigger concern is, uh, you know, if there's, if there, if we knew what type of acreage or square footage or whatever that uh, uh, is, a, is necessary, personally, I can keep my eye out. Uh, yeah. And in fact, I got one idea off the top of my head already. Um, so that, you know, if we had some idea of whether they need one acre, two acres, uh, whatever it would be, uh, because obviously if they could find another location, that's going to really uh, not only help them, but it's also going to help the, the town shed the highway department by opening up more available space for them as well. So. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll keep you apprised. Um, I know that we have a meeting coming up here soon, so I'll keep you posted. Okay. Thanks, Thank Alex. Okay, leaf peepers. So, leaf peepers, um, new folks in town, at least. Um, uh, what was the other fellow's name? Um, Who was the last race director? Uh, Roger Kranz. Roger Kranz. Roger has retired. Yes, Roger Kranz has come and talked with us about the Leaf Peepers half marathon and 5K run for a number of years now. And uh, last year, he um, told us that last year was going to be it for him. Um, Roger and his compatriots, um, you know, took the race from its old course, which is started in the village and then got over onto River Road and went out and back over in Duxbury um, a number of years ago, shortly around the, the flood time. Uh, the, the race course changed and they ended up starting at Pilgrim Park, going up Stowe Street, over Perry Hill, and then down the you know, Flats and up to Waterbury Center, and then back down over the, over the uh, community trail, over the golf course, and then back into the village. So these folks are new uh, race directors, and you'll have to introduce yourselves because I can't remember your names. Come on. Yeah, if you'd like to come up and sit, have a seat here. So I am, uh, well, my, my name is Andy Schufert. I'm the president of Central Vermont Runners. So I am not the race director, although I am involved in the race. And our race, we have hired a um, professional race director to run the race this year who couldn't be here tonight because he's way out west and uh, kind of on a trip that he planned. So it, his name's Will Robbins, and he's, he puts on a number of different events, uh, one of which is, the biggest one is probably at Trap Family Lodge. There's a Catamount Ultra Marathon event that he's put on for a number of years. So he's, he's fairly experienced in this. He, does, he hasn't really done um, many road races, so this is a kind of a new experience for him, but we've put this race on for a long time so we can work together and uh, give him the input he needs. Um, but we do want to make you aware of you know, the changes we've talked about, uh, mentioned that the, you know, the Perry Hill Waterbury Center course, we've decided has become um, 
too difficult for people to uh, want to be interested in. We've lost a lot of participation. The numbers have gone way down. And so we're uh, very interested in moving the course back to a short course, which is from the horseshoe at the state office complex and going out River Road and coming back um, as we, and coming back through the trail uh, behind the cemetery and into the state office complex. So we're, we're pursuing that and um, have uh, temporary permission from the state to use the, the horseshoe. And we've talked with the town of Duxbury. And so now we're talking with you to, to let you know about that change, um, which I think will help get our numbers back up I'm sure they won't be back what they were back 10 years ago um, because I think all races are kind of declined some. But what we would like to do is, is at least get back to where it makes sense to even put the event on. We need to have a little more participation. So, you mind me asking, Andy, how, how, what's the percentage of drop in, in uh, participation? I can give you some basic numbers. Um, the percentage I'm not certain I have that, but say our, the last year we ran this particular course, which is the pre-Irene, we, we, after Irene, we had to do some different things that weren't quite the historic course, but uh, we had 639 half marathon finishers in 2010 and 414 5K finishers, so, you know, that's 1,100 approximately people. Um, and that's some finishers, and this last year, in 2018, we had, between the two races, uh, about 400. Wow. So it's that's dropped big. quite a bit. And, you know, a lot of people, their reaction is, well, I don't want to go back up that hill again. It just, <laughs> I can understand that. Uh, so I said, I've done that once, I'm not doing that again. So we used to get a lot of repeat people that would just do it every year, do it every year, because they liked, you know, it's not too crazily hilly. So uh, I think going back to that should get us back to some better numbers. Uh, of course, we used to limit the field, and it would sell out, and we just say that's it. And that was probably at about that 1,100 people um, level that it would, it would be limited. We're, and I don't expect that we're going to get back to that at all, uh, but we could get back to, say, you know, uh, the last the last year on this kind of modified course, we had 634 and a half and 388 in the 5K, and that was in 2012 before we went to the Perry Hill course. Um, so that wasn't too bad, and that was that was kind of a modified course, like I said, because of Irene. We couldn't use the state office complex. We uh, ended up at Pilgrim and had to go across Route 2, and that didn't work uh, at all with the traffic control. So. Um, I think what we have now with using the historic course will be on Main Street for two tenths, three tenths of a mile going out that way and then come back on the trail and have a sort of a minimal impact uh, on the road out here, particularly with the construction coming up. So, so. You, you would go out across the bridge at the south or east end, end of the town? That's right. And, and then you'd come across the Winooski Street Bridge and go through the cemetery? Is that's that that's correct, yeah. And so the, our proposal is on Winooski Street Bridge, and I think we talked about this with Duxbury, uh, that we don't really want to have to completely close the road. I think at one time that was done. Uh, we, we think with the numbers that we have, there'll be less that we can uh, monitor the traffic and close and stop traffic as, as needed to get people through there. Um, and we will be using Waterbury Fire on the course as we've done in the past. Back in 2010, it was that way. Uh, and of course, last year, they were uh, helped us out with uh, traffic control on the um, Guptal Maple. Yeah, they've area. helped out on every year that it was on yeah. Perry Hill, too. So. So, so they will be involved, and they, most of them remember how it worked back when it was on River Road, so I think it, it can work well again this time. We did, when, when the proposal was made to us, first of all, I talked with Nick, our recreation director, and then Nick worked with Barb Farr and Bill Woodruff 
to make sure that we'd be okay as far as this um, and the Main Street reconstruction project will be still in full swing, you know, at that time of year. And uh, according to everything that we've heard, everybody's okay with it, right? So this new course, is it just one, one time around equates to the distance you want, or you got to repeat it? It's, uh, it's sort of an out and back because you go, of course, you go out, as we said, Main Street uh, over 100, and then back Main Street, Duxbury, down River Road, and they go way, way out past Camel's Hump Road, turn wow. around, and then come back across Minooski Street nice. Bridge. And it? So nice it's, uh, it's uh, and there will be a 5K, which is a loop. Um, and the 5K is, is actually pretty popular back in the day, it was. Um, and it's, it is a loop that it will be actually a separate event 15 minutes later after the half marathon, but it gets over with pretty quickly. And it will go out the same way and just instead of going out River Road further, just come across the Winooski Street Bridge and back and finish. So, um, so it will be sort of two events there. but. The, it obviously it doesn't take as long to get that one over with. So you guys will have to market this probably to let people know that it's the route is changing again from not going up Perry Hill. I mean, how will you go about doing that, informing people that uh, it's? Yeah, we'll definitely market that. Now that's that's Will's expertise since he's the you know the the, the professional guy, but he'll he'll use we'll use that in. You know, new course this year, new old course, back to the way it was, um, and, and you know we can do that with um, some print advertising. Um, he's got expertise in doing social media kind of advertising, so that will be come out that way. But we definitely will advertise that that it will be a um, a new course. Um, so do you have a participant list that that? Um you can send emails to, or or how does that work? Uh, yeah, is yeah there... we have we have our our old participants. If we get email addresses from them, we can we can email them and tell them. You know, that would be that would be another way to get yeah. people. And you know, the the race has really evolved from being having a lot of out of towners to being more Vermont oriented. So I think they'll hear more about it. The word will get around um, uh, from people that are in our club and in the <coughs> athletic association in Burlington right. they bring a lot of people so I think the word will get around and, and people will um, want to come back to it particularly ones that did the old course um, back in before we changed it so uh, but we, we definitely will have a marketing push to between the print print things and you set a date for this yet? Yes, it's October 6th, which is a Sunday. First, which has typically been, the, it's been, usually been the first Sunday in October. What's um, the fee to run in this race? We, Will is still working on the fees. I think he's going to raise it a little <coughs> bit. Um, I'm, I think he's thinking about $50 for the half marathon and probably forget what he said, but I think it's going to be like maybe 25 for the 5K, 25 or 30. And that will include a shirt and uh, we'll have some food at the finish. Um, he was even talking about doing some sort of, you know, like lunch box or something for him. But uh, the other thing that's significant to note is that we're going to change the time. Um, in the past, it's been at 11. 11 and 11:15 for the two races, which seems to be kind of late, uh, and so particularly with traffic concerns and things like that, we're going to do it earlier and start at 9:30. So, in that, with that hope of getting everybody out of the way before noon, uh, which I think would be a, a good idea, particularly with the road construction and all that. And do you start both races at the same time? Uh, the 5K starts 15 minutes later. And it would be done within everybody out of the way within a half hour to four minutes, probably. Uh, you were involved in last year's. 
Yes. Do you recall any issues, um, either medical or, or problematic um, issues from you know, other you know, vehicle operators or no, we, nothing we, problematic at all? We had, we had no problems with uh, vehicle operation, you know, anything like that. And we had you know, a lane closure, um, which is the way that course had to be done. We had a lane closure with a, a loop of where there was one one lane closed, and so the traffic had to go around the other way. So, um, which for for an extended period of time, so we had no problems, and, and really never had any problems. So since the the first year, which is 2013, uh, we've had a couple minor medical issues, some sprained ankles or something, and we've had to have. We usually have the ambulance uh, there at the finish line, an ambulance there uh, standing by, but. Uh, Medical problems have been none. The only problem I think we had last year was somebody got lost. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, they went the wrong. They went the wrong way, and it, it was someone who was hoping to win. Yeah, somebody. It was somebody who was in the lead. And they, yeah. they pushed from right on to left, all off a kneeling flats and left, which I, makes I the course a lot shorter. But. I happened to be there when that guy did that. Yeah, and one of my friends was running in the race and was yelling at him yeah. to turn around, and he thought he was chasing him. <laughs> so he kept running, he kept running faster. faster. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember that story now. Um, from a logistical standpoint, this will be much easier on uh, the town residents as well as the fire department. And the fire department enjoys doing this service. They'll be along the course. I'm sure they'll be helping with traffic at, at the Winooski Street Bridge. But, you know, uh, he's right when he talks about, you know, we, we would get some complaints. Every year it got a little bit better, but I think 2013, 2014, we had a lot of people upset because they wanted to go up Howard Avenue and they couldn't go up Howard Avenue and they'd send them up to the next road and no, you can't go up here. People, there were people who were trying to get, you know, to your house who were a little bit frustrated. So this will be much easier from a logistical standpoint and the uh, impact that it has on on the uh, traveling public who aren't involved in the race. So. Yeah, there'll be a, a brief closure twice for the starts of the race, and I think we'll probably, we'll have a police cruiser from somewhere. I'm not sure which, if it's Washington County Sheriff or who he's planning to get, but... Uh, to, to take care of that, and that that should be it. Other than the you know impact at the Winooski Street Bridge. Do you pay uh, Waterbury Ambulance a, a fee for uh, medical services? Yeah, I think we pay them a, a kind of a standby fee to 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 be there at the finish, and uh, and the firefighters, of course, we give a donation to for for their work. Well, I think the changing the start time to 9:30 is really a good idea because it's you know, peak foliage, and that's part of the problem. Yeah. Route 100 was getting crazy, and it's not getting any better. Yeah, and that puts it puts most of the runners uh, finishing up the race uh, here at about lunchtime, so they can go do something out know, here. So, uh, mm -hmm. and it's it. Um, I think it will. Yeah, I think it'll work better for everyone. We were really wanted to to do do it a little earlier. Do we need a motion or? I was just going to ask that. Yeah, I think it would be good. Uh, I'll make a motion for the Leaf Peeper run to happen on October 6th yeah. as uh, presented tonight. Start time at, you're, you're thinking 9 or is that definite yet? Yeah, 9, 9.30 and 9.45. Yeah. I second the motion. Right. Is there any wish for further discussion? Seeing none, all those who uh, wish to approve it say aye. 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 Right. Appreciate it, Andy. Yeah, Thanks thank for coming much. in. Thank you. Okay, manager's items, uh, pending legal and personnel issues. So the, let's do one of the personnel issues first, uh, which can be an open session.
<clears throat> I apologize for not sending this out on Friday. I had it ready on Friday and uh, when I was in Norton, Vermont, away from any ability to access my computer, I remembered that I didn't send it to you. So, um, Barb Fowler is the transportation liaison, um, has been working for us in various capacities since 2013 when she came as the uh, flood recovery director. And um, her scope of services now that she performs for us mainly have to do with the uh, transportation projects. Uh, the Route 100 rehabilitation project is still ongoing. Uh, it's got, you know, this is the, the final year of that contract, uh, and there is still some work that she needs to do there. Uh, and then, as you all know, the Main Street reconstruction project is gearing up. It's uh, actually started. We've got tree removal that's happening now, and um, there will be some uh, mobilization taking place, and hopefully, um, if all goes well, uh, they'll start the actual construction around the 15th of April. So um, Barb has been an employee of the town since uh, 2015, I believe. Uh, when she first came here, she worked for Armada uh, Consulting Group. And um, we, we had contracted with Armada to do the flood relief work. <laughs> and then as she transitioned towards doing both flood relief and the transportation liaison work, we had a, um, um, a separation from Armada that was, uh, it, it wasn't um, contentious at all. We, we talked to them, we said we think that we can do this a little bit more cheaply ourselves if we kind of cut out the proverbial middleman. Uh, Barb had been an Armada employee for a number of years, but she was willing to come work for us directly, and Armada was happy to have us have Barb. So um, she is on a contract, uh, the employment agreement. Um, the, the purpose for the agreement is that it's, she's looked at a little bit differently than the standard municipal employee, um, consulted with attorneys back when we first did this in 2015, but Barb didn't need health insurance and she didn't need retirement. Um, and she doesn't actually work enough hours for the uh, health insurance and the retirement. Some years she's working enough that she would be eligible and some years not. So um, we were uh, helped out by Scott Cameron back in our first year of um, uh, putting this contract together. So the, the agreement is very similar to what it has been since the beginning. Uh, there's a slight, uh, I say slight, it's a, about a 2.3% increase in her uh, weekly salary. Um, I, over there I have two um, measurements of the CPI, one through the end of uh, December, which was 1.9%, one through the end of uh, February, which was 1.5%. Uh, so it's slightly above the rate of inflation, but I think uh, you know, she's certainly earned her pay for us. Um, she works in this contract, it will be an average of 24 and a quarter hours a week. Um, sounds like an odd average, but it just, that's the way it averages out over the course of the year. She had been working 20 hours a week in 2000, uh, the last half of 2017, or the last quarter of 2017 and through 2018. Um, now that the Main Street project is getting ready to go, she's going to be bumping up to 25 hours a week on average for now. And then once we get into November, she'll go down to about 23 hours a week. So it just works out to 25 and a quarter hours per week. And you can see on the second page under uh, number two in letter B what her gross weekly salary will be um, and the, the, hourly the hourly wage rate. 
And as I said before, um, the wage rate looks very high compared to the wage rates of most of us other town employees, including myself. It's much higher than my wage rate if you broke it down hourly. But there are no benefits at all in Barb's contract. So we pay Social Security uh, for her because we have to, but there's no health insurance, there's no retirement, there's no uh, uh, life insurance, disability insurance, all of that stuff is, is all on her own. So um, I would ask you to uh, authorize this. It runs from April 1st this year until March 31st next year. Um, what was the last thing I was going to say about it? <laughs> I guess that's it. So if you have a question, you can ask it. But. The only question I would have, just out of curiosity, um, does the town, out of this wage, does the town deduct, like, the Social Security and the unemployment? And the yeah, I mean. It's comp out, out, of her, out of this amount, and she gets the remainder. She takes care of that. She doesn't take care of that herself, right? No. Okay. We, we pay her this wage, and on top of it, we pay the employer share of Social Security. She pays the employee share of Social Security. So from the, per from the perspective of FICA, right. she's just like any other employee. But there's no, that's the only, if you want to call FICA a benefit, that's the only deduction um, addition that we, that we have to pay. <laughs> and oh, I know what I was going to say. So if you did the math, this comes to about $79,000 on an annual basis. And in our budget for 2018, and that, that 79000 takes you through to March 31st next year. Uh, in our 2018 budget, there's an expectation that there'll be $65,000 coming back from the Agency of Transportation because we have, we have an agreement with VTrans uh, for this position. Um, she is the, the liaison for all of these projects, and we have a grant from VTrans. So this is going to cost the town about fourteen, five, fifteen thousand dollars dollars um, It's a bargain from our perspective. Yeah. And she'll be staying through till the end of? The expectation, yeah, this, the contract says it, it can be renewed. It's automatically renewable through the end of 2021. The Main Street project is supposed to end June 30th of 21. There could be change orders, you know, rain, whatever. So uh, we'll figure that out. But this is, uh, at this rate, it's a, a one year deal. So would somebody like to make a motion then to uh, approve this employee agreement contract between Barb Farr and the municipality? Motion authorizing to sign it. Yeah, that would be good. Authorize Bill to sign it. Okay. Bill, I have one question. Does so if she's working an average of 24 and a half hours a week, is that times 52 equals 1,274 hours? That's what I just did the math. Um. If she's paid for a few, um, kind of a co combination of sick, personal, and vacation leave. For 144 that, hours, so that is a benefit. 1,300 hours, something like that. Okay. I'll make a motion. This um, contract. And authorize me to sign. And authorize Bill to sign the contract. I'll second. All right. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 Okay, Does, could you give some more on that motion? So um, we need to, I would recommend that we go into executive session to discuss the legal issue that we've been discussing for months now. And then there's one other personnel issue that needs to be done in executive session. So if you can, somebody's got a motion to make. Yeah. 
I move that the general public knowledge of the details of potential litigation involving the town of Waterbury would clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage. That's motion number one. I do, do one at a time. Okay. Okay. Somebody would like to make a uh, second that motion, please? Second, second the motion. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those approved, say aye. 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 <clears throat> I move to enter executive session to consider potential litigation involving the charge of Mr. Oak and KO v. Town of Waterbury and related confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing legal advice to the town and to discuss a personnel issue. Is there a second for that motion as well? I'll second. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Okie dokie. And I'd like to invite Fred Saintink, um, Kelly, what's your last name? Kelly Kindiston. I knew it. There's too many Kellys that work over there. Um, and then Nick Letty, um, our attorney, as well as Nick Nato, the rec director, into the meeting. Okay. 